time to look at the quantitative aspect of the reactivity of CH bonds. In the previous video, we talked about the fact that fluorination is highly exothermic with pretty much any type of carbon, methyl, primary, secondary, or tertiary. And because it's not really um, selective, you know, it reacts with everything, um, it's not synthetically useful. And on top of that, because the fluorine fluorine bond is so weak, reactions that incorporate fluorine with carbon could potentially be explosive. So one has to be very careful when doing such types of reactions. And only trained chemists with specialized equipment are the ones that get to do this type of stuff. And, and even them have to be very careful as to what they're doing. So for us, fluorine is not gonna be a key player. On the other hand, chlorination this is not per se selective, but we have a little bit, a tiny bit of selectivity that we can use to our advantage. Uh, chlorination does work with all four of them still, but it's a little bit more in preference of primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, CH bonds. Now, bromination on the other hand, primary and methyl CH bonds are no, is, they are a no-go. Secondary, to a small extent, it can happen, uh, but the, the priority or the preference really for bromine is to react with tertiary CHs, allylic CHs, and benzylic CHs. Iodination, on the other hand, is really not useful at all because every single reaction that we investigated in the previous video showed that not only is the first propagation step highly endothermic, but the overall process as a whole is endothermic. So you never get any energy that you can use to feed onto the process to continue the cycle. So iodination via radical mechanisms is just not going to happen. Other synthetic processes that we'll talk about in the future can be used to form that carbon iodine bond, but through radical mechanisms is most definitely not going to happen. So we're going to focus on chlorination and bromination of the organic molecules. And we're gonna start looking at some quantitative uh, calculations and you could even say measurements of these particular molecules. So in this example, we're gonna start with this branched alkane and we're gonna add chlorine and we'll expose this mixture to a little bit of light. This doesn't necessarily have to be UV light. It could be uh, even visible light for a short period of time and it might do the trick to generate the chlorine radical that will start the process. Now, if you use too much chlorine or you expose it for too long to light um, or these things are too concentrated, you could actually polychlorinate your organic compound. Uh, that's certainly a possibility, but for the sake of simplicity, we're going to constrain ourselves to only looking at the mono halogenation, in this case, the monochlorination of the compound. And from that point of view, all we have to worry about is to determine how many different kinds of carbons there are in the molecule. Uh, carbons that have H's, by the way. So looking at this molecule, what we can find out is that there are four unique carbons in the molecule. Notice that the carbons down here are not labeled because technically speaking, this CH2 is equivalent to the CH2 up here. And the reason being is because both of them are connected to a CH group and both of them are connected to a methyl group on the other end. So they are identical. And then uh, the last group on the right side, that CH3 is connected to a CH2. This CH3 is also connected to a CH2 and they basically lead up the same pathway. So they are equivalent to each other. So there's only four different kinds of carbons that bear hydrogens. So for the terminations of the products, all you have to do is simply place that chlorine bond to the carbon of each of the unique places. So you have chlorine attached to position A. You have chlorine attached to position B. You have chlorine attached to position C, and once again, that carbon and this carbon are the same. So even though I'm drawing the chlorine down here, uh, this is not a different molecule. This is still type C based on the uh, denomination here. And down here we have chlorine attached to position D. Those are the four 
possible products we can get out of this molecule upon monochlorination. Experimentally, it is found that the yields of these molecules that get produced are as follows. You get 13% of type A, 17.4 of type B, 43.5% of type C, and 26.1% of type D. So what I'm going to do is convert each one of these ratios into a relative rate associated with the type of carbon-hydrogen bond that we're dealing with in each one of these molecules. And I'm going to start with the first position, the type A uh, bond. Now, A, if you look at the original reactant, so everything is going to be from the point of view of the reactant. Um, if you look at type A right here, this is a carbon that bears three hydrogens on it. But that carbon is bound to one other carbon. So technically, type A is a primary carbon. It has connectivity to one other carbon. This type of hydrogen yields 13.0% of the corresponding product. So what I'm going to do is play a trick of conversions. I'm simply going to take this percentage and associate it to the number of hydrogens in the molecule. And the idea is that the entire reactant has a total of 3 plus 3 plus 3, that's 9 plus 2 plus 2, that's 4, so we have 13, and then we have one more from type B. So we have a total of 14 hydrogens in this molecule. And so percentage-wise, as far as the substitution of hydrogen for chlorine goes, 14 hydrogens are equated to 100% hydrogen content. So the 13% can be divided by 100 and multiplied by 14 H's that are present in the entire compound. Technically speaking, the percentages cancel out, and you're now dealing with the amount of H's in the molecule. So here you can make use of the fact that the type A hydrogens, there's only three of them. So you could divide this by three hydrogens so that the units technically cancel out. And this one right here is technically one molecule because there's three type A hydrogens in one molecule. And if you perform this calculation, divide 13 by 100, multiply that by 14 and divide the resulting values by three, you find out that this equals 0.607. All right, I'm gonna continue forward. Let's take a look at type B. Type B is a carbon that is connected to one, two, three other carbons. Therefore, this is a tertiary carbon. And the percentage is 17.4. We do the same thing as before. We divide by 100, multiply by 14 H's, because that's how many hydrogens the reactant has. And type B, there's only one hydrogen on position B. So this will be one H on the bottom and one molecule on top. Carrying out the calculation, we find out that this equals 2.436. Okay, down here uh, for type C. Type C is worth... Um, well, first of all, it's a secondary carbon because this carbon is connected to two other carbons. So that's the thing we're noting right here. Uh, we make a total of 43.5% yield of that product. Converting that to amount of hydrogen, 100% of the molecule in terms of hydrogen is equal to 14 hydrogens. Uh, type C has not just two, but remember, these two carbons are equivalent. So these two hydrogens plus these two hydrogens are type C. So we actually have a total of four hydrogens of that type. So divide by four, multiply by one molecule, and carry the calculation to find out that this is equal to 1.5225. And finally, for type D, this carbon is bound to only one other carbon, so it is a primary carbon. The amount that we get in this reaction is 26.1. So 26.1 is divided by 100, multiplied by 14 hydrogens, the total amount in the reactant. Uh, type D, we have three hydrogens on this carbon, but this other carbon is equivalent. So we have three plus three or six hydrogens altogether. Carry out this calculation, you find out that this equals 0.609. At this point, what we do is we take the ratio of every single one of these values based on the smallest value that we got. So the 0.607, that's the reference. And we'll, now we're gonna divide everything by 0.607. 
to get the relative rates. And of course, 0.607 divided by 0.607 is undoubtedly 1. 2.436 divided by 0.607 is actually 4. 1.5225 divided by 0 .61, uh, 0.607 is 2.5, and 0.609 divided by 0.607 is technically 1. So what this is telling us is that the rate of a tertiary hydrogen is four times as fast as the rate of a primary CH bond. And the rate of a secondary CH bond is two and a half times faster than that of a primary bond. So this is where the selectivity comes in. And we will use this to ultimately calculate the percentages of products we expect to get from a monochlorination. All right, so these values are the ones to keep in mind. Primary is equal to one, secondary is equal to 2.5, tertiary is equal to four for monochlorinations. Let's take a look at the same picture, but now using bromine instead of chlorine. In this case, Br2 is the reactant. We expose that to some light for a small period of time to produce the Br radical. And then we end up forming the four different products that are based on the four different carbons in the original reactant. These are the yields. Now, one thing you might notice is that some of the molecules have very low yields. You know, before with chlorination, we at the very least had like 17, 15%. Now we're down to less than a percent for some of them. Okay, so we're going to determine the rates the same way we did for chlorine. We start with type A. Type A is a primary set of uh, CHs. The percentage is only 0.15. If we divide that by 100 and multiply by 14, because that's how many hydrogens we have in the molecule, and then divide by 3 H's, because that's how many H's there are of type A, we find out that this equals 0.007, or 007. All right, now, type B, which is a tertiary CH bond, we are yielding 82.95% of that product. Divide that by 100%, multiply by 14, total H's in the reactant, divide by the lonely H that's of type B in the molecule, you find out that this equals 11.61. For the type C hydrogens, the percentage is 16.59. If we divide that by 100% and multiply by 14, we then can utilize the fact that there is four types, uh, four hydrogens of type C present in the molecule. So divide this by four to yield a value of 0.5807. And finally, type D, the percentage is 0 0.30. There is six of those type of hydrogens. So you take the 0.3, divide by 100, multiply by 14, the total number of hydrogens in the original molecule, divide by six, and you get 007, right? 0.007. Divide everything by 0 0.007, A and D are obviously going to be 1. But notice what happens with B and C. The values are humongous. A tertiary CH is almost 2,000 times more reactive than a primary CH when you use bromine instead of chlorine. And a secondary CH is 83 times more reactive than a primary hydrogen. So you can see right here, just by comparing these numbers, bromination is absolutely very selective, totally favoring the tertiary brom uh, bromination of a tertiary CH uh, alkane, and to a lesser degree, that of a secondary. But the primaries are almost uh, an afterthought with bromination. So bromination's are basically best for tertiaries and to a lesser degree secondaries. Whereas chlorination, you're gonna get all of them to undergo the halogenation. Okay, now with that knowledge, in the next video, I'm gonna walk you through the process of predicting the percentages of the products of monochlorination and monobromination. So see you in the next video.